In the phrase, we are the government, the useful collective term, we, has enabled an ideological camouflage to be thrown over the naked, exploitative reality of political life. For if we truly are the government, then anything a government does to an individual is not only just and not tyrannical, it is also voluntary on the part of the individual concerned. If the government has incurred a huge public debt, which must be paid by taxing one group on behalf of another, this reality of burden is conveniently obscured by blithely saying that we owe it to ourselves. But who are the we, and who the ourselves? If the government drafts a man or even throws him into jail for dissident opinions, then he is only doing it to himself, and therefore nothing improper has occurred. Under this reasoning, then, Jews murdered by the Nazi government were not murdered. They must have committed suicide, since they were the government, which was democratically chosen, and therefore anything the government did to them was only voluntary on their part. But there is no way out of such grotesqueries for those supporters of government who see the state merely as a benevolent and voluntary agent of the public. And so we must conclude that we are not the government. The government is not us. The government does not in any accurate sense represent the majority of the people, but even if it did, even if ninety percent of the people decided to murder or enslave the other ten percent, this would still be murder and slavery, and would not be voluntary suicide or enslavement on the part of the oppressed minority. Crime is crime. Aggression against rights is aggression, no matter how many citizens agree to the oppression. There is nothing sacrosanct about the majority. The lynch mob, too, is the majority in its own domain. But while, as in the lynch mob, the majority can become actively tyrannical and aggressive, the normal and continuing condition of the state is oligarchic rule, rule by a coercive elite which has managed to gain control of the state machinery. There are two basic reasons for this. One is the inequality and division of labor inherent in the nature of man, which gives rise to an iron law of oligarchy in all of man's activities. And second is the parasitic nature of the state enterprise itself. We have said that the individualist is not an egalitarian. Part of the reason for this is the individualist's insight into the vast diversity and individuality within mankind a diversity that has the chance to flower and expand as civilization and living standards progress. Individuals differ in ability and in interest, both within and between occupations, and hence in all occupations and walks of life, whether it be steel production or the organization of a bridge club. Leadership in the activity will inevitably be assumed by a relative handful of the most able and energetic, while the remaining majority will form themselves into rank-and-file followers. This truth applies to all activities, whether they are beneficial or malevolent, as in criminal organizations. Indeed, the discovery of the iron law of oligarchy was made by the Italian sociologist Robert Michels, who found that the Social Democratic Party of Germany, despite its rhetorical commitment to egalitarianism, was rigidly oligarchical and hierarchical in its actual functioning. A second basic reason for the oligarchic rule of the state is its parasitic nature, the fact that it lives coercively off the production of the citizenry. To be successful to its practitioners, the fruits of parasitic exploitation must be confined to a relative minority, Otherwise, a meaningless plunder of all by all would result in no gains for anyone. Nowhere has the coercive and parasitic nature of the state been more clearly limbed than by the great late nineteenth-century German sociologist Franz Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer pointed out that there are two and only two mutually exclusive means for man to obtain wealth. One, the method of production and voluntary exchange the method of the free market, Oppenheimer termed the economic means. 
The other, the method of robbery by the use of violence, he called the political means. The political means is clearly parasitic, for it requires previous production for the exploiters to confiscate, and it subtracts from instead of adding to the total production in society. Oppenheimer then proceeded to define the state as the organization of the political means, the systematization of the predatory process over a given territorial area. In short, private crime is at best sporadic and uncertain. The parasitism is ephemeral, and the coercive parasitic lifeline can be cut at any time by the resistance of the victims. The state provides a legal, orderly, systematic channel for predation on the property of the producers. It makes certain, secure, and relatively peaceful the lifeline of the parasitic caste in society. The great libertarian writer Albert J. Nock wrote vividly that the state claims and exercises the monopoly of crime. It forbids private murder, but itself organizes murder on a colossal scale. It punishes private theft, but itself lays unscrupulous hands on anything at once, whether the property of citizen or of alien. At first, of course, it is startling for someone to consider taxation as robbery, and therefore government as a band of robbers. But anyone who persists in thinking of taxation as in some sense a voluntary payment can see what happens if he chooses not to pay. The great economist Joseph Schumpeter, himself by no means a libertarian, wrote that the state has been living on a revenue which was being produced in the private sphere for private purposes, and had to be deflected from these purposes by political force. The theory which construes taxes on the analogy of club dues, or of the purchase of the services of, say, a doctor, only proves how far removed this part of the social sciences is from scientific habits of mind. The eminent Viennese legal positivist Hans Kelsen attempted in his treatise The General Theory of Law and the State to establish a political theory and justification of the state on a strictly scientific and value-free basis. What happened is that early in the book he came to the crucial sticking point, the pons asinorum of political philosophy. What distinguishes the edicts of the state from the commands of a bandit gang? Kelson's answer was simply to say that the decrees of the state are valid, and to proceed happily from there, without bothering to define or explain this concept of validity. Indeed, it would be a useful exercise for non-libertarians to ponder this question. How can you define taxation in a way which makes it different from robbery? To the great 19th century individualist anarchist and constitutional lawyer Lysander Spooner, there was no problem in finding the answer. Spooner's analysis of the state as robber group is perhaps the most devastating ever written. It is true that the theory of our Constitution is that all taxes are paid voluntarily, that our government is a mutual insurance company, voluntarily entered into by the people with each other. But this theory of our government is wholly different from the practical fact. The fact is that the government, like a highwayman, says to a man, your money or your life, and many, if not most, taxes are paid under the compulsion of that threat. The government does not, indeed, waylay a man in a lonely place, spring upon him from the roadside, and, holding a pistol to his head, proceed to rifle his pockets. But the robbery is none the less a robbery on that account, and it is far more dastardly and shameful. The highwayman takes solely upon himself the responsibility, danger, and crime of his own act. He does not pretend that he has any rightful claim to your money, or that he intends to use it for your own benefit. He does not pretend to be anything but a robber. He has not acquired impudence enough to profess to be merely a protector, and that he takes men's money against their will merely to enable him to protect those infatuated travelers who feel perfectly able to protect themselves, or do not appreciate his peculiar system of protection. He is too sensible a man to make such professions as these. Furthermore, having taken your money, he leaves you as you wish him to do.
He does not persist in following you on the road against your will, assuming to be your rightful sovereign on account of the protection he affords you. He does not keep protecting you by commanding you to bow down and serve him, by requiring you to do this and forbidding you to do that, by robbing you of more money as often as he finds it for his interest or pleasure to do so, and by branding you as a rebel, a traitor, and an enemy to your country, and shooting you down without mercy if you dispute his authority or resist his demands. He is too much of a gentleman to be guilty of such impostures and insults and villainies as these. In short, he does not, in addition to robbing you, attempt to make you either his dupe or his slave.